and sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mark when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin. But from my view, I believe that there should be no more babies. Birth control, a tiny pill that, quote, revolutionized the way that women live their lives. If you thought about the most significant inventions of the 20th century, you might consider the internet, the television, or even the microchip. But few inventions have changed society to the same degree that the birth control pill has. It gave women the power of control over their fertility, allowing them to make private decisions about contraception without needing to negotiate with a partner. To date, 75% of women globally take this pill. But is the juice worth the squeeze? It's fair to say that this little pill caused great controversy and completely changed history. But just how profound has the impact really been? The first oral contraceptive pill was approved by the FDA in the 1960s. And by the end of that year, approximately 1.2 million women in the United States were taking it. By 1980, approximately 10.7 million women were on the pill. And this trend only continued to rise. As of recent data, 65% of women aged 15 to 49 are using some form of contraception. So what exactly is birth control. To fully understand the impact of birth control, well, we have to start at its roots and the very controversial intentions of the most famous pioneer, Margaret Sanger. She wasn't just a woman advocating for women's reproductive rights. She was deeply committed to eugenics, a pseudoscientific belief that society could improve human genetics by controlling reproduction. In her 1922 book, The Pivot of Civilization, Sanger wrote extensively about the menace of overpopulation by those she deemed unfit, calling them human weeds who were weakening society. She argued that limiting their reproductive rights would purify the human race. Her goal wasn't just birth control for women's empowerment. It was population control, specifically aimed at those she felt had bad genetics. This included African Americans, immigrants, people with disabilities, and the poor. And her belief in eugenics led her to the infamous Negro Project of 1939. And this was an effort to bring birth control to black communities under the guise of helping them. But her intentions, they were far more sinister. In her own words, Sanger stated, we don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And again, these are quotes. Sanger's vision, while hailed as revolutionary, was deeply rooted in controlling and reducing populations that she considered inferior. The introduction of the pill wasn't about women's liberation. It was about the state's ability to dictate life and death, controlling who had the right to reproduce. So what's more sinister, the illusion of freedom or the state controlling life and death under the guise of freedom. And this leads me to my next point. At the very beginning of its inception in 1960, approximately 30% of married women used contraception. Today, that number is 75%. So with all of these women taking this little pill, do they actually know what it's doing to their bodies? Or worse, the potential consequences that come with it. Most hormonal contraceptives are made from synthetic hormones. And these are different from the bioidentical hormones that your body naturally produces. These synthetic hormones disrupt your body's natural hormonal fluctuations in ways that can lead to serious health consequences. Studies have linked long-term use of birth control to a variety of comorbidities, including blood clots, increased risk of certain cancers, and even autoimmune disorders. Furthermore, birth control can alter your body's stress and inflammation responses. By flooding your body with synthetic hormones, your body reacts differently to stress, making it much harder to manage your emotional state and your physical well-being. On the surface, birth control or hormonal contraceptives are designed to prevent pregnancy by interfering with the body's natural reproductive process. And the most common forms of birth control include the pill, patches, injections, and IUDs, along with some implants. And the synthetic hormones that they deliver, typically estrogen and progesterone, or progestin, which mimic the natural hormones that are produced in your body, but with key differences that disrupt your reproductive cycle. And the primary goals of hormonal birth control are three things. One, preventing ovulation, or stopping the release of an egg from the ovaries. Two, altering the cervical mucus, thickening the mucosal lining in the cervix. And three, changing the uterine lining altogether. Together. It thins the lining of the uterus, making it difficult for even a fertilized egg to implant. And how this happens? Well, let me explain. Normally a woman's cycle is dictated by the fluctuation of her hormones, primarily 
estrogen and progesterone. Each month, FSH or follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone or LH produced by the pituitary gland trigger the development of an egg and its subsequent release during ovulation. But birth control prevents ovulation altogether by inducing these synthetic hormones. And this maintains a certain balance of hormones that trick the body into thinking it's already pregnant. By keeping estrogen and progesterone levels elevated, the pill prevents the surge of FSH and LH that would normally cause ovulation. Now progestin, one of the synthetic hormones used in birth control, thickens the mucus of the cervix. Normally, cervical mucus becomes thin and more slippery around the time of ovulation. This allows sperm to travel easily through the cervix and reach an egg. But when a woman is on birth control, the thickened mucus creates a physical barrier that makes it much more difficult for sperm to swim through and even reach an egg. Lastly, as I alluded to earlier, birth control also impacts the endometrium or the uterine lining. Under normal circumstances, this lining thickens each and every month in preparation for a potential pregnancy, providing a nourishing environment for a fertilized egg to implant and grow. But birth control keeps the lining thin and less receptive to even a possible implantation. So what are the consequences to this? It all sounds good. If we don't want to get pregnant, makes sense, right? By now you know that birth control fundamentally shuts down your body's natural reproductive hormones that regulate ovulation. But this shutdown of the menstrual cycle can cause significant changes over time. By halting ovulation altogether, women lose cyclical hormone fluctuations that contribute not only to fertility, but mood and overall energy levels. These synthetic hormones flatten out the natural peaks and valleys in a woman's hormonal landscape and the continuous thinning of the uterine lining caused by hormonal birth control can have long-term effects. A thin uterine lining, which is a desired outcome based on preventing pregnancy, can in some cases contribute to conditions like amenorrhea or negatively impact a woman's fertility after birth control as the endometrium needs to establish a place where it can sustain a pregnancy. In addition to this, birth control can also interfere with bone density. Estrogen plays a key role in maintaining healthy bones. And for young women, prolonged suppression of estrogen through the use of birth control can potentially increase the risk of osteoporosis later on in life. On top of this, hormonal contraceptives have been linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and other issues such as blood clots, heart attacks, and even strokes. Now, as I alluded to earlier, birth control also impacts how your body reacts to stress. Studies suggest that hormonal birth control alters the HPA axis, which controls the body's stress response. Birth control users tend to have a blunted cortisol response, the hormone response responsible for managing your stress. Over time, this could lead to altered emotional regulation, higher levels of anxiety or depression, and difficulty managing stress, aka how you behave, how you soothe, how you cope, and regulate overall. And for chronic use, we have to ask, well, what are the outcomes if we take this over a long time horizon? For many women, fertility does return, but in some cases, it can take a very long period of time or potentially impact their ability to get pregnant altogether. And while many people will say that using birth control decreases the risk of cancer, like ovarian or endometrial cancer, they are also associated with an increased risk of breast cancer and cervical cancer. This is particularly important for women who start taking this at a very young age or who use it over extended periods of time. Now, as far as the physical side effects that we see, weight gain, fluid retention, and increased inflammation are common. Birth control can alter something called insulin sensitivity and overall body fat distribution. Again, your body thinks you're pregnant. And this can lead to overall metabolic changes that impact not only your body weight, but body composition. Additionally, synthetic hormones can contribute to being in a chronically inflamed state, which can affect overall health and increase, again, the risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, this is where it gets interesting. One lesser known impact of birth control is its impact on sexual attraction and mate selection, which perfectly brings me to my next point, how this impacts your mental health and overall psychological functioning. Hormonal birth control has been associated with mood changes and some studies have shown an increased correlation between birth control and anxiety and depression. Synthetic hormones alter serotonin and other neurotransmitters in the brain, which overall can influence mood regulation and mood state, which places women who are on birth control at a higher risk for mood disorders, particularly those with a pre-existing history of depression. But here's where it gets even more alarming. It doesn't just change your mood or your body, it completely shifts your mindset. When you're on birth control, your body's natural biological drivers are completely overridden. And this means that the type of partner that you are attracted to changes. Several studies have examined the changes that women experience while on birth control pertaining to their partners, as well as how stopping birth control can influence attraction and overall relationship satisfaction, which could ultimately lead to breakups or 
divorce. These findings reveal that birth control might be influencing major life decisions in ways that many women are completely unaware of. When a woman is not on birth control, her preferences for a mate can fluctuate throughout her hormonal cycle. Research shows that during the fertile phase around ovulation, women tend to prefer men who have traditionally more masculine features, strong jawlines, deeper voices, and dominant or confident behavior. And this preference is thought to be driven by evolutionary biology, as women are subconsciously seeking traits that imply good genetics, specifically during their most fertile days. However, hormonal birth control completely overrides this natural fluctuation. Because the pill keeps hormonal levels consistent and prevents ovulation, it flattens out these fluctuations that impact overall attraction. When we look at how this impacts mate selection with women who are on the pill, well, they tend to prefer men who have more feminine traits. These are men who are perceived as more nurturing, supportive, and stable. Ultimately, this shift can lead to women making mate choices that they may not otherwise make if they weren't on birth control. One of the most significant studies examining this phenomenon was conducted in 2010, and it found that women who are on the pill tend to prefer men with much softer facial features and lower testosterone levels. And this is in stark contrast to women who are not on birth control, who are much more likely to prefer more masculine features, specifically during ovulation. What this study also suggested was that women who select partners on birth control may find themselves less physically attracted to their partner after they stop taking the pill. And this is because their natural mate preferences do return after they stop taking it and their hormonal cycle resume. And this shift in attraction and mate selection can have long-term consequences, particularly when these women decide to stop taking the pill. Another important study conducted in 2014 looked at relationship satisfaction regarding newlywed couples, where women had either been on or off birth control when they met their partners. And the study tracked these couples over time to assess whether birth control had any impact on their attraction to their partner or not. And the findings were striking. Women who met their partners on birth control were much more likely to report less attraction after coming off of the birth control pill. Conversely, women who were not on the pill when they met their partner tended to report higher levels of physical attraction throughout the entire relationship. And this raises an important question around the impact of birth control on relationship dynamics. If women are selecting partners while on the pill, what happens when they stop taking it and their preferences shift. And this study suggested that these changes in attraction could lead to overall relationship dissatisfaction or even divorce. Now let's talk about how this pill fueled a cultural revolution. Birth control didn't just change individual lives, it altered the very fabric of society. With the rise of the feminist movement in the 1960s, the pill became a symbol of liberation. And feminists pushed the narrative that women could have it all, career, independence, and control over their reproductive choices. But was it really liberation or was it manipulation? Through media and propaganda, women were told that taking control of their fertility through use of the pill would open the door to a new life of independence. But here's the truth. While women entered the workforce in record numbers, this shift had far-reaching consequences. In 1960, only 37% of women were in the workforce. By 1980, that number had jumped to 50%. And today, 57% of American women work outside of the home. But as women rushed into the workforce, well, men began to leave it. In 1953, 96% of men were working. By 2020, that number had dropped to 69%. While some analysts are contributing this to the shifting gender dynamics created in part by the feminist movement. And as women became breadwinners, family dynamics ultimately changed. Children once raised primarily at home, were now increasingly cared for by the state. The government stepped in with daycare programs and school systems, taking over the role once held by families. But this wasn't just a natural evolution. Many argue that the shift of child rearing responsibilities from parents to the state was fueled by the feminist push of liberation and, well, birth control made it all possible. In 1960, only 6% of children under five were in daycare. By 1990, that number had soared to 58% with women in the workforce and children now being raised by institutions, while well, the cultural landscape completely shifted. Feminism told women that we could do it all, be professionals, mothers, wives, but at what cost? And men increasingly sidelined, facing growing shame and blame. This shame, fueled by feminist rhetoric, often painted men as the obstacle to women's success rather than their partners. And the feminist narrative shifted from equality to completely demonizing masculinity. The primary message of feminism became breaking free from male oppression. And birth control 
Well, it only furthered the divide. It gave women control over their own fertility, but in return, changed family dynamics and gender roles in a way that has completely altered the foundation of Western society. And this has ultimately led to fewer marriages, lower birth rates, and an increased dependency on the state. And one stark consequence that we all have noticed is the rise in divorce rates. In the 1960s, divorce rates began climbing right in tandem with the rise of birth control. This easy access to contraception severed the connection between sex and reproduction, transforming the entire dynamic around relationships. And today, we're seeing the fallout, a society where nearly 50% of marriages end in divorce. Now, another really important topic, fertility. More importantly, birth rates. Around the world, birth rates have been declining sharply, and fertility rates are now below the replacement level, specifically in Western societies. And some experts point to hormonal birth control as the contributing factor here, by disconnecting women from their natural fertility cycles, pushing the narrative that children are a burden, that marriage is meaningless, and that family can come later once you've established yourself successfully in a career, acquiring your own independence and success. The pill has not only changed how much we think about reproduction, but how often we even reproduce. And while birth control is often marked as a form of empowerment, it's also played this role of pushing women into the workforce. The idea that a woman's value is now tied to her productivity rather than her own family has its roots in this new form of liberation. In this shift towards independent women who continue to remain single, well, many argue that this has fractured the family unit altogether, and this combined with the feminist narratives has accelerated the erosion of traditional values. And speaking of traditional values, the rise of feminism with the simultaneous decline in traditional religion have contributed to an overall shift in societal values, gradually replacing old norms that focused on culture to new ones that focus on, well, the individual. And these changes, particularly since the 20th century, have reshaped personal identity, family, gender roles, and cultural expectations. Previously, people were expected to prioritize the well-being of their families and their communities over their own individual desires. But modern values continue to promote personal autonomy, self-actualization, and freedom of choice, even at the consequence of society thriving as a whole. The focus has shifted to personal empowerment, where pursuing one's own goals and desires is now celebrated and considered a key aspect of self-worth and success. The problem with empowerment, though, is that it's subjective and can easily be a form of manipulation and aid in the destruction of personal respect. One of the most visible shifts in our society now is the construct of gender roles. Previously, we had pretty clear roles of what it meant for women and what it meant for men. Men as the provider and women as the homemaker and nurturer. But feminism has actively challenged these roles, arguing for equality in every arena of life, ignoring biological strengths and differences. But I digress. And today, gender roles have become much more fluid. Women are encouraged to pursue careers, leadership positions, financial independence, while men are increasingly expected to share in child rearing and domestic responsibilities. What's more, concepts of gender fluidity and non-binary identities have also gained significant prominence, further challenging traditional roles identified by biological sex. Now, I would be amiss if I didn't mention that marriage has been the cornerstone of traditional values, and we can see that dissolving rapidly. Previously, marriage was seen as a sacred institution. Currently, it's seen as completely stupid and unnecessary. In traditional settings, marriage was seen as a lifelong commitment, essential for societal stability and the foundation for raising children. However, with the rise of feminism and the decline of religion, marriage is no longer seen as an essential milestone. Many people delay marriage and opt for cohabitation or reject the institution altogether. Feminism has promoted the idea that women do not need marriage for financial security, emphasizing a focus on careers and personal growth before or even instead of starting a family. And as mentioned earlier, divorce rates have continued to climb as people focus on individual happiness running on a hedonistic treadmill that's at full speed, completely neglecting maintaining traditional family values at all costs. Now, another important thing to note is that traditional values did uphold strict guidelines around sexual behavior, often confining it to marriage and emphasizing chastity, especially for women. Sexuality was framed within moral and religious boundaries, and reproduction was seen as the centered experience around having sex. But with the invention of birth control and continued feminist rhetoric, specifically towards reproductive rights, these traditional beliefs around sexuality have been largely replaced with the concept of sexual freedom. Feminism has championed the idea that women, 
like men, should have the freedom to engage in meaningless sexual relationships on their own terms, without any pressure or responsibility. Moreover, feminist movements have pushed advocacy for abortion rights and further contraceptive access, further weakening the link between sex and traditional family values. And these changes have redefined sexual norms in the context of autonomy, liberation, and personal choice. Traditional values often emphasized self-sacrifice for the greater good, whether for family, community, or spiritual well-being. And the notion of enduring hardship in service of duty was seen as virtuous, but today the focus has shifted towards self-realization and personal happiness. The rise of self-care culture, therapy, and individual empowerment has completely shifted societal values into focusing on the person versus the greater good. And this can lead to a lot of false beliefs such as everything should always be good and we are designed to just be happy. And if something isn't easy or it doesn't come quickly to you, well, it's something or someone else's. Fault. And the cultural landscape continues to evolve. And with it, the tension between these new rules and values with the remnants of traditional ones. And this brings me to my final point. The pill has been sold to us as a form of freedom, yet has made us completely reliant on the state replacing men. And when you take the opportunity to look a little bit deeper, you start to see a different picture, one of manipulation, societal control, and unintended consequences. For women, what felt like liberation may now feel like chains. And for men, this explains a lot of the frustrations that we see in relationship dynamics, divorce, and natural roles between men and women. The hand that we've chosen to trust to have our best interest at heart may be nothing more than the devil in disguise. And if you found this video interesting and you want to understand how this has further shifted dynamics in relationships, then click this video and I'll see you there. If not, fuck off. <laughs> Bye.